No. <clears throat> We've briefly, or not so briefly, uh, covered the transactional uh, components of the TIKV cluster. So now we're going to further expand on the transactional component uh, known as TIDB, or the transactional uh, access to data, or, or the, um, yeah, the database no known as uh, TIDB. Yeah, let's just go ahead and cover that. So just a quick recap, uh, this slide was shared earlier, and in this section, we will zoom into the transaction uh, component of, 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 the, of this distributed system. So a quick overview. Um, TIDB is an open source distributed uh, NewSQL database that supports a hybrid transactional and al analytical processing um, also known as uh, HTAP workloads, um, which means hybrid transactional analytical processes. Um, it is a MySQL, so so this TIDB right here, it's a MySQL compatible um, and has features such as horizontal scalability, strong consistency, and high availability. TIDB can be deployed on-prem or in cloud. Um, and notice that whenever we receive a transactional operation, TIDB will act as a front end to the TIKV backend uh, data storage layer. Uh, something like this, right? Uh, in other words, the TIDB server is a stateless SQL layer that ex uh, exposes the connection endpoint to the MySQL protocol to the outside world. The TIDB server receives SQL requests, performs SQL parsing and optimization, and ultimately, ultimately generates a distributed execution plan, um, and and we'll cover it like a or, or or we'll just show it the 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 architecture because this is pretty uh, deep thing. Uh, so it's horizontally scalable and provides a unified interface to the outside uh, through the load uh, through load balancing components such as. Uh, so we can use different technologies, maybe like a Linux virtual server or an HA proxy or F5. So that would be here at, at, at this layer. Um, uh, yeah, to, to the outside world. Um, so yeah, let's say that we have um, three three applications with uh, with a MySQL uh, sort of um, layer. We could lo load balance to to any of these sort of um, uh, TIDB services. Uh, it does not store data and it's only for computing. So no, no data storage here. Um, it's only for, for, for computing and SQL analyzing, uh, transmitting actual data read uh, request to TIKV nodes. So yeah, it, it just performs like the optimization of the SQL um, dialect per se, but uh, yeah, this is actually a good pra good practice to process data uh, on the actual uh, data nodes, and we'll see why in a second. <clears throat> okay, so uh, TIDB transactional processing. Um, so let's talk about tables, columns, and rows. Oh my! So in uh, OLTP, which means online transaction processing scenarios, there are many operations such as adding, deleting, changing, and searching for data on a single or multiple rows, which needs the database to read a row of data quickly. Therefore, each key should have a unique ID, either explicit or implicit, to make uh, a quick uh, to make it quick quick to locate. So here we're going to talk about just general uh, best practices. Um, so if you were if you've worked with databases in the past, you'll you'll kind of notice a pattern. Um, many OLAP queries require a full table scan. Um, if you can encode the keys of all rows in a table into a range, the whole table can be efficiently scanned by range queries. Um, so tables. Let's talk about tables. Um, to ensure that data from the same table is kept together. For easy searching, TIDB assigns a table ID to each table 
represented by table ID. Table ID is an integer that uh, is unique throughout the cluster. So usually um, data in the same table, we might want to lo uh, maintain, we, we, we might want to keep uh, close, close by. Um, columns. TIDB assigns a row ID represented by um, row ID. Uh, example, column one, column two, column three, uh, etc. To each row of data in the table. The row ID is also an integer, uh, unique within the table. For uh, the row ID, uh, TIDB has made a small optimization. If a table has an integer type primary key, TIDB uses um, the value of this primary key as its row ID. So basically here we're just saying that uh, the column is sort of um, represented by, the, by an ID. Um, Rows. Um, so TIDB supports both primary and secondary indexes for fast row search. So let's say, uh, so so we, we already have the table sort of uh, portion uh, that's ideally uh, locally um, in, in the, uh, within the same region, um, data region. We, we have that we can uh, quickly scan through, uh, horizontally scan through uh, a table by uh, their ID. So if we want to select column one and three, we can just go ahead and uh, quickly uh, scan the, the, the row ID. Um, but then the, how, how about the, uh, the row, row search? So for row search, uh, we're going to have secondary indexes. And that's the, this is uh, usually a best practice to, uh, to prevent full table scans. So uh, both unique and non-unique indexes are supported in, in TIDB. Uh, similar to table data mapping scheme, TIDB assigns an index ID to each index of the table represented by an index ID. Uh, for primary keys and unique indexes, it, uh, it is needed to locate the corresponding row ID based on the key value pair. So each, um, um, so for, ordinary secondary indexes that do not uh, need to satisfy the uniqueness constraint, a single key might correspond to multiple rows. If needed, to query the corresponding row ID according to range of keys. So the idea here is just to kind of uh, assign an index to, to, to each row. Um, so whenever we want to search for a particular, let's say that um, this, is, this can be lexicographically um, sorted or, or I don't know. Um, whenever we successfully uh, find uh, 10 rows by their secondary uh, index, uh, we, we can uh, just exit the um, query execution. Uh, but, but generally, it's going to be much more efficient to use this uh, secondary index instead of having to perform a full, um, a full scan. <clears throat> yeah, for fast row search. Yeah, okay. Um, metadata management. So each database and table has metadata that contains various attributes. Uh, this information is persisted uh, in TIKV uh, itself. Each database or table is, is assigned a unique ID, uh, and TIDB uses a dedicated global key value pair to store the latest version uh, of structure information of all tables. Okay, so TIDB's SQL layer. Um, TIDB's SQL layer uh, translates SQL statements into key value operations. Um, it forwards these operations uh, to the data layer, to TIKV. Uh, the distributed key value storage layer assembles the results returned by the TIKV. Look back here. And finally, returns the query results to the client, to the caller. Uh, the nodes at this layer are stateless. Uh, these nodes themselves do not store data right here. Uh, they're merely uh, uh, for processing. Um, but this sort of architecture has some obvious problems. Uh, if we were to talk about a distributed um, uh, database scenario. So as the data is being scanned, each row is read from TIKV via a key value operation. 
with at least one RPC um, overhead, which can be very high if there's a large amount of data to be scanned. It's not applicable to all um, if if the query is not applicable uh, applicable to all rows. Data that does not meet the conditions or criteria does not need to be read. Uh, from the returned result of this query, only the number of rows that match the requirement is needed, not the value of those rows. So, in the, uh, this is specific to this um, to this qu uh, query. So, here in this case, we want to um, we want to read one row. We want to filter for whatever um, uh, contains or, or TIDB in, in the name. And, and we just want to return the count, not the actual values. So that, that's what this means right here. Um, so in this case, we're doing some uh, extra effort or extra computation that's not really needed. So in the next um, present in the next slide, we're going to talk about um, the distributed SQL layer, not not just the, the SQL layer portion. Um, so to solve the previous problems. Uh, the computation should be as close as possible to the storage node um, to avoid lar large number of RPC callings. Um, the SQL predicate condition should be pushed down to the storage layer or, or the storage uh, node for computation so that only valid rows are returned, which avoids meaningless network transfers uh, between these two uh, components. Um, then any aggregation function, uh, example, the count function right here, um, can also be pushed down to the storage nodes and, and not compute that up here because, uh, yeah, for, for obvious um, network reasons, right, um, that we mentioned earlier, um, the RPC overhead. So we, we ideally want to perform all of these operations down at this level and not so much up here. Um, so um, any aggregation functions must be pushed down to the storage layer um, for the pre uh, for, for pre aggregation, and each node only has to return the result of the aggregation and not all the data uh, for for further aggregation up here. Uh, the SQL layer will aggregate pre uh, pre generated results returned by each node. So. Uh, an example of this is uh, the map reduce sort of uh, framework um, that tackles this problem. So let me quickly talk about this. So whenever we want to um, process, do do a big data processing, let's say that um, we we usually will schedule our workloads uh, to process locally on 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 each uh, on each node, so so that we can we don't have to be sending data back and forth. Um, Causing maybe a, a network uh, overload right here um, for each uh, execution stage. We ideally want to, um, let's say, map the problem to the to the storage uh, layer. And here we would perform. Uh, in this case, it's uh, the filter and aggregation. And then the reduce layer would actually aggregate all of the the results from each of the of the um, of the Lo uh, local uh, sort of uh, computation and just uh, return whatever the, the the final result is per se. This is called the result phase, and and this is the result that we'd be sending back to the the caller. That's s sort of what we just talked about the the MapReduce framework. <laughs> so we won't get into the details of this architecture, but this is just here for for completion. But a single instance of the um, core SQL layer uh, looks something like this. So there's a, a, a set of optimizers. Um, and, and there's a, a session also involved here. <clears throat> and uh, so at a high level, the user's uh, SQL request is sent to TIDB server, either directly or via a load balancer. So we talked that here we could uh, lo load balance. Um, it de depends on the, on, the, on the use case. It can be like a single client, like this one right here, or it can be a load balanced. Um, um, th different, different, uh, uh, um, different, uh, a pool of 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 um, so so different processes per se. And, and Kubernetes, you would call is different pods enabled with the MySQL sort of um, client. 
So we would lo load balance uh, either directly. Um, talk to the to the to the TIDB server or or via a load balancer. Um, TID, TIDB server will parse the the MySQL uh, protocol packet, uh, get the content of the request, parse the SQL request synthetic, synthet, synthetically, and semantically, develop and optimize query plans. Uh, uh, where's the okay the query plan? Um. Execute a query plan and get the uh, and get and process the data. All data is stored in the TIKV cluster, so it's um, so in this process, TIDB server needs to interact with TIKV and get the data. Finally, TIDB server needs to return the query results to the user, just as we spoke over here. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's all a dance between like the query plan that, that you need to execute and, and how it, it's going to get mapped to the uh, to the to the to, to 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 the data layer. Okay. So next, we're going to show up a, a a demo of how we would um, interact with a, a MySQL application for transactional processing uh, or querying or. Uh, operations. <laughs> 